very much, Mr. Chairman. Members, you know, I was in the Texas legislature until 07, and I, I always feel like I need to say I voluntarily retired. My people did not retire me. Um, I also have another connection with you folks. Uh, my husband is from Ohio, and all of my in-laws are up around the Cleveland area, so it's good to be here again. Um, I understand that y'all have had uh, some testimony over the last few weeks that have uh, involved some emotion, and I apologize for doing that to you yet again, but that's pretty much what I'm here to do. I'll tell you that I didn't grow up in a house with guns. Uh, I didn't come from a hunting family, although I always believed in the Second Amendment. And I just personally was never into it. But when I was 21 and moved out on my own, a friend of mine gave me a gun, taught me how to use it. And at that time in the state of Texas, we didn't have concealed carry. You could not legally carry in really any way, shape, or form. In my early 30s, I was with my parents. We went to a little local cafeteria there where the chairman was talking about the, in Colleen. It was a beautiful, sunny day. The place was packed. In other words, it wasn't some dark alley somewhere. And uh, a guy drove his truck through the front window, knocked over a number of tables. People went flying. And of course, you think it's an accident. This was back in 1991. You think it's an accident. But then we heard gunshots. My father and I immediately got down on the floor, put the table up in front of us. My mother got down behind us. And the shooting continued. And you're looking for an explanation. Again, back in 91, these, these mass shootings weren't really occurring. So you're looking for an explanation. You're waiting for the guy to say something like, all right, everybody put your wallets up on the table, or, 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 or uh, you know, this is a robbery, something like that. But he just kept shooting. And I saw the guy come around the front of his truck, and he was simply taking aim, pulling the trigger. He'd walk to the next person, take aim, pull the trigger. He was executing people. And it took a good 45 seconds to figure that out. And that's, a, that's an eternity. When I realized what was going on, I reached for the purse on the floor next to me and I thought, I've got him, I've got this guy. Realize we're down, table up in front of me, I've got a place to prop my arm. He's up and maybe 15 feet from me and I've hit much smaller targets at much greater distances. And then I realized that a few months earlier I had made the stupidest decision of my life. My gun was about 100 feet away in my car, completely useless to me because I did what most normal people, law-abiding people would do. I thought, you know, what are the odds of my needing a gun? And if I need a gun, it's going to be on a back road if my car breaks down. It's certainly not going to be in a crowded restaurant. So my gun was out in the car, useless. At that point, my father took my attention. He said, I've, I've got to do something. I've got to do something. He's going to kill everybody in here. So when, I, when he saw what he thought was an opportunity, he rose up and he went at the gun. But the guy had complete control over the room and he simply turned and shot my father in the chest. My dad went down in the aisle, maybe seven, eight feet from me, and as dreadful as this sounds, I saw the wound and um, I basically wrote him off at that moment, even though he was still alive. The good thing was it made the bad guy change directions slightly and he went off to my left. And shortly after that, I heard another window break, and I thought, my God, here comes another one. But I realized people were getting out that back window that someone had broken out. So as I peeked up over the top of the table, I thought, as soon as I get my chance, I'm going for it. When the guy's back was turned to me, I stood up, I grabbed my mother by the shirt collar, and I said, come on, come on, we got to run, we got to get out of here, and then my feet grew wings. And I made it out that back window. When I did, I ran into my manager friend, whom we had been eating with. He came out a side door and said, thank God you're okay. And I said, yeah, but Dad's been hit, and it's bad. And I turned to say something to my mother and realized she hadn't followed me out. To make a long story short, the police officers, bless their hearts, several of them were patients of mine, were in the building next door. And in an odd twist of gun control fate, the management of the hotel where they were having a conference next door didn't want them to carry their weapons around for fear that it would concern the patrons. So their guns were in locked trunks out the parking lot. Precious moments were wasted. They told me later that once they got into the Luby's building, they didn't know who the bad guy was at that point, but they did see a woman out in the middle of the floor cradling a man that had been mortally wounded. 
They said they saw a young man walk up to her, put a gun to her head. They said she looked up at him, put her head down, and he pulled the trigger. My parents had just had their 47th wedding anniversary and mom wasn't going anywhere without dad. They said all they had to do was fire a shot into the ceiling and this guy rabbited to a back bathroom alcove area, exchanged a few shots with him and then put a bullet in his own head. 23 people were killed that day. Largest mass shooting up until the Virginia Tech shooting that we've ever had in this country. And I'm gonna tell you something that you're, you're gonna have a little trouble believing, but I, I would encourage you, if you do doubt me, please go look at the newspapers the next day. I was interviewed and I said, you know what, I'm not mad at the guy that did it. He said, how can you not be mad at him? I said, we're not talking about a career criminal. We're talking about somebody who went nuts. How do you be mad at a rabid dog? You don't be mad at it. You might take it behind the barn and kill it, but you don't be mad at it. I said, but I'm mad as hell at my legislators because they have legislated me out of the right to protect myself and my family. And I wasn't the only one in there. There were other people whose weapons were out in their car. Now I've had people say, well, you know, you could have missed. Okay, it's possible. Well, your gun could have jammed. Well, it was a revolver, so not likely. But again, it's possible. The one thing that you can't argue with, I don't think, is that it would have changed the odds. It would have changed the odds. I don't think anyone can argue with that. We've had shootings since then, so many dreadful shootings now, they don't even waste more than a day on, on CNN or MSNBC. We've had them at Columbine, we've had them at uh, the McDonald's, let's see, we've had, them at, uh, we've had them at post offices, we've had them at daycare centers, we've had them at other restaurants. And isn't it interesting that every single one of those, there were no guns allowed. I don't think you can name a single mass shooting in this country where guns were allowed. If guns are the problem, then why don't we see these shootings at skeet trap shoots or, or uh, NRA conventions or the dreaded gun show, places where there are thousands of guns in the hands of at least as many law-abiding citizens. Somebody explain that to me. I'll tell you why it doesn't happen. It's because people that do this want high body bag counts. They're not gonna go someplace where they think people might be sitting there armed. They're going to go where they can shoot people like fish in a barrel. And I cannot begin to tell you how frustrating it is to sit there and wait for it to be your turn. Let me leave you with just a couple of things. I, I know you, there's a tendency to always think, well, that's, it, it, it always happens to somebody else, right? But it is happening, I don't think anyone can deny with more frequency. So imagine, later this evening, or this weekend, you're out at a restaurant, a decent restaurant, not even a fancy restaurant, just a decent restaurant that happens to serve wine. You're having an enjoyable meal with your children or your grandchildren, and all of a sudden you happen to notice out of the corner of your eye somebody walks through the door, and it's a single man, and he's got a trench coat on, and you think, gosh, it's a little warm for that, but you don't think anything more of that. Moments later, you see him open his trench coat and pull out a weapon. At point blank range, he shoots the elderly lady in front of him. Of course, you're aghast and you think, what's that all about? An argument? A family argument? And then you see him go to the next person and pull the trigger. And then the next person and pull the trigger. As he's going around the room, as he levels his gun on your eight-year-old son or grandson's head, at that point, even if you've chosen not to have a gun, don't you hope the guy behind you has one and knows how to use it? One last thing I will tell you, I would much rather be sitting in jail with a felony offense on my head and have my parents alive. And with that, I thank you all very much. I know you do yeoman's work here, and I empathize with you. So thanks for letting me come. Any questions, sir? Family tragedy with us. And, uh, can the chair ask a question? Current Texas law, I can still carry. I take a gun. Could that have had a gun on it? Yes. <laughs> we, have, um, we have a fairly good concealed carry law now. It's not as good as Arizona or Vermont or Alaska, but, but we're improving it every year.